Good afternoon, this is Jason Dean here at Film Fanatic Headquarters here in the uh, giant city, the sprawling met metropolis that is known as Northport, Maine. So, yeah, I uh, hope everyone's doing good. You know, again, usually I like to start off the show with thanking people for checking out the videos. I've been cranking them out. And it's been a blast. I did a really great show on Sunday uh, afternoon with my friend Emmett Leller. And that was a blast. We talked about, you know, all things horror. But the main focus of the show was Stephen King. Obviously tied to, you know, a massive uh, figure in the world of horror. So we did a show around that. And the reason we kind of focused on Stephen King was I'm a, you know I I'm a big fan of his of his work. I'm not as uh steeped in in it as uh as my friend Emmett is. He has a real deep knowledge of all of his books and he's you know very well read. He's he's but he's also in general a very well read person uh anyway. And I just thought that would be a cool thing uh to you know tie in all the numerous books that he's put out and and still continues to put out and then also do you know all of the there's been so many film adaptations of his of his work uh and his earlier films uh, like i remember we talked about or i brought up films like christine and uh, john carpenter's christine and toby hooper's salem's lot those two films I remember, and also Pet Cemetery, the original. Those three films I remember as a kid seeing them, and they they really scared me. And I always loved those films, uh, and I still love them today. I even seen collectively those three films in quite a few years, especially Christine and also Pet Cemetery, which I'm looking forward to watching again. But those are those are movies that I had seen when I was a kid, and they really you know made an impact on me and I remember uh you know reading the first book I read and I mentioned I had mentioned it in the show that we did the first Stephen King novel I ever re I had ever read was um Pet Cemetery and then the movie came out afterwards and it was I remember it was the first time where as a kid or you know where I was kind of coming into uh you know finding coming into the thing of finding a like a love for reading uh where i saw like oh wow a book that i really like and enjoy uh and you know scared me they're you know making it into a film and i was like wow like i remember that being like the first kind of time that i saw that happen from like something jumping out of from you know taking something from the literary world and putting it into uh like a film uh and you know since then it's it's pretty commonplace now you know it could have been one uh you know i think it, it's probably safe to say at that time especially in the horror genre in the like 80s and 90s you know it was relatively rare that uh that 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 happened uh it i mean it did but I think nowadays, you know, the last five to ten years or so, even a little bit longer, it's it's kind of commonplace. Lots of movies are based off of books now, and there's, you know, kind of all these spin-off stories based based around a book or prequels and blah 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 film film adaptations. That's more commonplace now. But anyway, so that was a really great show, and we covered all kinds of material and. You know, Emmett did a pretty good deep dive on, on, on his work, and uh, you know he's a great, one of my best friends, and it was, it was a super blast, and I, you know, I really appreciate people checking out the video, and uh, you know, sharing it, talking about it, because uh, that's you know really what I love about doing this uh, show is just to kind of get people fired up and to get conversation going about. You know the commonality that we all love around the uh, the horror genre. So yeah, really great. So thanks again for people check for, for people checking out that video. There's gonna be more videos coming your way. I'm gonna do a couple more videos in um, probably a couple weeks. So stay tuned for that. 
I'm trying to move things to where I can do more of interview segments. That's something I notice at least there's a few guys that I really love on YouTube that are, you know, big source sources of inspiration for me to do this wacky thing. And I know I don't have the, you know, the technical proudness um, or the whole like marketing brain that a lot of these guys have. I understand it and I understand how it works and kind of what I need to do. But it's a funny thing because I don't know. It's like when I think of it in terms of like a marketing thing, I just, I don't know. Part of my, part of my brain just kind of turns off. Like I understand how it works and how some of these guys are really successful. And I understand that. And I can understand how that machine works. But, and, but then also part of me is like, well, I want to just kind of figure things out and try to just do things, you know, by finding my own way somehow. So it's always a funny, you know, it's always a funny dilemma. I, I do that a lot with music. Um, I've talked a lot about that before in certain other shows of where, like, well, like one example, say for instance, like, like I always talk about quantum and on the show, my electronic band and, and, you know, around that time when that band started, I, my, my life musical life had shifted to where I was starting to kind of concentrate and work with artists that were and bands that were doing more original bass material. And I found over time, you know, uh, of kind of moving in that direction, I found that's kind of where my passion is as far as like, you know, really trying to get into that space of creating original content because I felt like, you know, any of these bands or, or artists at the end of the day, you know, you might like it, you might not like it, but that's that uh, element of originality is going to be like your calling card. And that really was, uh, you know, when I kind of got wind of that or I got a sense of that, I decided to, you know, focus mostly on that. I still like do projects and groups that have cover tunes and I don't have anything uh, against it, but my my love or my passion or the time that I want to put into crafting s stuff is 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 focused on the in, in the arena of originality so and it, it was interesting too because that all happened around the same time so and it was great it was a real great learning experience but the one thing I remember when when that stuff was happening after a couple of years and suddenly it was like a, a very different way of of shifting my focus but then also how you you know how you obviously market your stuff and then gigs were very suddenly they were a little bit different you thought of gigs a little bit differently because well hey you're going out and you're going to play two or three hours of your own material so you kind of need to have your stuff together you need to have your act together so it became a little bit more of intimidating but I think in the end it was very good or it was a good experience, but, but I remember, you know, coming, you know, into that idea and that mindset more and more. And I came across a buddy of mine had sent me a video uh, of this woman who is a singer songwriter. And she basically has, uh, you know, she's able, she's very fortunate and very able to make a living off of just music. But she has this, basically, it's like a, uh, and how, basically, she, she also, aside from her music that she sells and she produces and records and makes a living off, she also has like this, these tutorials about how uh, marketing strategies, marketing strategies work in the industry, you know, especially now in the age of like independent artists. So it was, it was, you know, very much based on like a corporate kind of model to a degree where it comes down to two degree dollars and cents and how you specifically market you, you find your target audience that you know the people that like we'll say for example for quantum like you find your demographic right you find your demographic of 
you know, say, and people that tend to like, you know, generally I would say it's pretty safe to say that, say, for electronic music, people that generally like electronic music are in the age group of like, say, you know, late teens to about 32, roughly, you know, like, so the the general demographic for for people who love electronic music or have a passion for or, or you know spend money in that and you know for supporting that genre tend to be on the early you know the younger side of the demographic you know early late teens to 20s early 30s you know and the same thing for like say you know a lot of indie rock or you know uh, things like that stuff that can kind of be considered to a degree like trendy and modern you know to a degree so but this woman was talking about well okay when you have this project or this band you you know the first thing you do you you know you put your stuff out there you know you, you first you you get a website built you get uh you get you find all the socials that exist you know facebook twitter instagram spotify uh you know twitch whatever you know uh, you you uh, start a youtube channel you find all these things then you get this product that you feel represents what you what you are as an artist and you you know you 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 get it crafted and you put it together to a point of where you feel you're happy you know you're self-satisfied and then you market it through all of these platforms and then you have to share post constantly tagging people and basically you have to have this like uh, uh like kind of more or less un unleashing a storm of, of of a way to create this wave where you're going to be interacting with people and on one on one hand it's like that's one of the amazing things about the digital age that we have now is you know virtually all of those things with all the different platforms, you know, you can do all of that for free. You know, it doesn't cost you a dime. You know, when I grew up in high school or whatnot, or even the days when music was kind of first hitting the internet with, say, things like MySpace, you couldn't really do those things. You know, you had a real limited capacity to how you could market your things, um, so forth. So you were, you know, you were kind of limited. But now you can, you can, you know, you can have an endless amount of platforms and you can do it for free. So she was saying, this woman was saying, basically you, you know, you, you amass, uh, this high profile online, you get a product that you feel is of good quality and that you're happy with that You're satisfied and that it's, you're satisfied with, and that you feel really represents what you're doing. So the next step, after you have this campaign, you launch the campaign to reach an audience for whoever's out there. And then you also turn it into, to a degree, a part-time or full-time job of basically staying up on those things. So basically, you're commenting constantly on people's posts or you're trying to interact with anybody who is liking your stuff. And, and then... She also said, like, kind of the next phase is, like, over time, it might obviously can happen fast or it can take maybe a couple of years or whatnot. And maybe it doesn't happen. But she said, basically, if you have this, like, a campaign that's pretty steadfast, you'll find, like, an audience. It could be a really small audience or it could be a big audience. But chances are it's going to be, it's going to start off with this really tiny little audience. And say it's like, you know... Uh, maybe you put out a song or an album that is, uh, say, uh, like a real modern rock album, you know. And so then people, your little audience strikes an interest to the product that you're, that you are putting out there. And you're doing something that's kind of genre specific as far as, you know, like a modern rock you know your your own rendition of your own material but it's very much you know catered to uh you know a very modern rock audience so then you so then she said the next phase is that well okay you you find this audience but then you connect with them and then you basically try to like milk it for all it's worth 
and every product that you do after that you know under this name or this label or this banner is going to be very much always curated to that group uh meaning you're you know if you have a group of say 25 year olds that like stuff that sounds like the cranberries and that's that happens to be the kind of style that you're doing after that you need to milk you connect with that you have to milk that audience for all it's worth by sharing content on your socials and all those things and that's your audience so then from that point on you basically you know you you use a lot of those same kind of tropes or you stylistically you stay you kind of stay in a certain confine in these certain stylistically you're saying you stay in the confines of okay music that sounds like the cranberries or that is very much inspired by the cranberries so you have so everything is super focused on exactly what you're doing and every album can be different or new but it's still going to have this kind of preconceived idea that it's going to sound like 90s cranberries to a degree and so everything was incredibly this woman was talking about these things every about how everything was incredibly uh curated to this audience and then once you have that connection for that style of what of whatnot then you just milk it and you you know you work on it and the same thing can be said like say for electronic music like you know if an artist puts out something that is like in the lines of say like dead mouse uh, like that's something or skrillex like music that's kind of considered you know say dubstep like say you put out a track and it has that vibe to it um and you get this reception after that point more or less what this woman was saying at that point that's when you you milk that you you connect with that audience and but then you you try to focus on putting content out that is totally geared to people who like Skrillex or the dubstep thing. And it has, you know, a lot of those characteristics and traits of, of that particular style. But you can obviously still, you know, create your own thing and, and be creative. But you have this preconceived idea when you're going into producing and writing music that it, it I got to make it for this kind of audience. And, and this woman was, you know, obviously very successful, um, with what she was doing. But for me, it's like, I found when I came across these videos, uh, I found for me, and again, it's just my opinion and my, my head is up my butt, but you know, and it was, obviously she, what she was talking about was something that was, is real and that she's an example that that path is very successful. You know, it's very, very business oriented. Um, and she's an example of how this following these specific steps and rules to a degree can make you successful. And for me, on the other hand, it's like, I feel like my brain and my, my whole kind of disposition kind of swings the other way. Um, and when I came across these videos of where she was kind of giving these tutorials, it, for me, although it was very interesting and insightful, for me, it came across as like this kind of bad infomercial. And it felt like this thing of like, well, you know, I don't really, you know, I think music, at the end of the day for me, music and art, all those things, whether there's a small audience or a big audience, I feel like if something is done with whatever genre it is, if something is done to a degree with sincerity and where there's like, you know, where it feels like it's coming from a real place um, and there's a lot of passion behind it, there's a lot of love, I think that regardless of style or or whatnot, I think regardless of, of, of style, that stuff will eventually find an audience and connect with people because it will be based on something that is, you know, a true representation of that artist. It's not really about thinking, going into thinking of, well, okay, I have this demographic of this core audience. So I gotta, you know, I gotta make things for, for this audience. For me, it's like, well, at the end of the day, you know, it could be a small, very small audience or maybe nobody, but then it could also be the other 
side of things where you could have a large audience. To me, it's about, you know, if the artist, if it feels genuine, it's from a, a sincere place, they're really expressing what they, you know, something that's interesting and different, and they're not working under these confines or these, to a degree, what I feel are like these limitations of thinking of these preconceived marketing tools as opposed to trying to make the art for art's sake and trying to make the music for music's sake or trying to direct that film for, for, for that. But I understand how that works, you know. So I, you know, I, I had that happen to me years ago with Quantum, actually, where, um, you know, and I realized, like, that can be a polarizing view because, you know, I don't think it's necessarily um, whether or not even you like something or, or not. It, it's really about just trying to do something. And, you know, some people will like it. Some people won't like it. You know, some sometimes people don't like any of it. But it comes, but for me, it's when I get in touch or find an artist or a director that I really love or a film, I feel like it has, there's a certain degree of where I feel like it's got, it's, a, it's something, there's something original about it. And there's something where it feels like it's from a real place, like where this person was, you know, they were passionate about it. And to me, if I get that sense from the art, of whatever it is, whatever the medium is, to me, that's the selling point, And that's where I am. I become a fan. Regardless of genre or regardless of style. Um, but I had that, I had one experience with, with that whole thing when I was actually two experiences around that, um, around this very specific thing with quantum. And it's like, I realized with quantum, you know, our music has, lots of different elements you know there, there's a lot of music in it or a lot of things that um a lot of music that i'm inspired by that is you know quote unquote non non-electronic music you know particularly like jazz uh but i've over the years i've found a way to try to like incorporate you know lots of different styles hopefully into what we do and i realize there's also elements of the music that is looked at as kind of fringe or, you know, something that's not very commercial. And so it has, you know, it, for some people, it could be something that they're not, they don't know what to think of it. They think, and it's happened to me a lot and it still does, but like sometimes people will, their reaction to it will be, oh, it, oh, I like it or it's, it's cool. It's good. It's great dance music. And then sometimes people will be like, I don't know what to think of it. It's a little bit weird. It's a little bit too strange. Um, so-and-so and you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's too weird for me. Or sometimes people who are say not into electronic music, um, and, and see it or hear it, they'll, they'll kind of dismiss it and just say, well, it's just DJing. You're not really, you know, you're just behind a computer and Touch, touching buttons so it's not really music it's like music to me is is somebody with an electric guitar and you know playing a live bass and singing into a microphone so you have those three things and um but at the end of the day like i've been really fortunate and really surprised by people who i didn't think would like the music seem to uh respond in a real positive way but but I generally think that's kind of, you know, the feedback. And a lot of times we have people where we're playing gigs and people are just kind of staring at us like, what the hell's going on here? Like, this is weird. If they see me, you know, jumping around with a mask on or a wig or whatever, and it's fine. You know, like, I, it's not a question. You know, I understand people. It's got a fringe element. Some people are not going to like it. And or they have this preconceived notion about electronic music. That's totally fine. You know, like people don't have to like or dislike something like they are entitled to their opinion. But when I was getting, when I was starting this conversation, I was talking about, um, a little marketing thing or the, like targeting a demographic audience. I've had that happen to me. I've had that happen to me three times specifically around quantum. Um, one time I, it happened with a friend of mine years ago when we were first playing the first year that we were playing quantum, um, we were playing like a handful of gigs and a friend of mine at the time came out to the gig and he had pretty good, he had a pretty big variety of, of, uh, you know, music that he was into. But when it came to like electronic music, 
he was like really into like kind of straight up kind of house music, you know, and stuff that was very much based around um, dance stuff like techno and house music. And and I remember like he came to one of our gigs and we had played I know we played like an hour or two hour sets, two hour set. And I remember he came up to me and he said to us after the gig, he's like, you know, I really liked your set. It was it was cool. You know, like, it's really great. I really love the dance stuff. But he, I remember him saying all this other stuff where you have like these weird noises or you're, you know, kind of screaming into the microphone or there's this, there's these like weird passages where the music kind of gets dissonant or just strange. He's like, what you should do is just cut all that out, cut out all the weird parts. Basically, I think, that, I think that's what his exact words were, were cut out all the the weird parts and just make straight up four and a floor house music and just do that because that's the best part of what you're doing. Just focus on that and that will get you fans. And, uh, and I was, you know, happy that he gave me his, his opinion, but I was just like, I was kind of shocked too. And, um, and then the two other examples I had were, or actually one example that I had, well, two examples. A long time ago, also with Quantum, we were we had played this gig, and I had this guy who came who had come to one of our shows, and he really liked some of our music a lot. And I remember he came up to us, um, and he wanted to do some recording with us, and he had you know a background with working with a lot of like kind of new age artists. The guy, the the guy's name I can't, I wish I could remember, but this one artist he worked with was a pretty well known artist in the world of kind of you know um, uh, new age stuff, and and some of our music with Quantum, say for instance, has I like I'm very much influenced by ambient music. Um, I like I'm a huge Brian Eno fan, um, and I really. I'm really inspired by things like uh, Aphex Twins, ambient works. And so I love a lot of minimalist ambient music. And so that music has always been a big part of what we do and, and is always a big inspiration. And I remember we did, so this guy who had approached me, he wanted to pay us to do this music for him, for this production he was working on. And and I remember when we were, we were in the studio trying to work out things, he was like, he was, he became kind of this real control freak. And he was like, well, okay. He would take one of our tracks that we had and he'd be like, okay, you know, like say one tune we had, we have this like real kind of ambient sparse kind of thing in the beginning. And then it would get into where there was beats and, and maybe some vocal stuff and whatnot. And he would be like, well, okay. All this other stuff aside from the ambient stuff with the beats and the vocals and the live bass he would basically say, well, that stuff, you know, you should just cut out and just edit it and just focus. You should just only work on, he's like, I think with your ambient music that you're doing, you really are like, this is really, he, he was very, he said some nice compliments, but he basically said with this ambient music you're doing, it's really beautiful. And I think it's, it's got this potential to reach this massive audience. And I think that you should focus on that. But he said, you should disregard, you know, basically he was, saying exactly what my other friend had said, he should disregard all of this other stuff and cut it out and not just, and just pursue this like quote unquote, you know, new age ambient kind of career. And needless to say, our collaboration didn't work out and we never worked together really after that. <clears throat> and the biggest example that that happened to me uh, in regards to how I started off talking about this I was, this was fairly recent. I was, you know, during the, during my the season that I, you know, winter, fall, whatever, or usually late winter, spring, I usually, that's usually the time when I, you know, try, uh, I start booking, trying to book gigs for Quantum and, and what, what have you. And there was a guy that I knew, I've met a couple times in person, and he had worked with a couple of bands that I had been in. And he was kind of a promoter guy, and he did lots of different work. And he, uh, 
was doing, um, you know, various kinds of things. And so we were doing lots of, you know, collaborations to a degree, but then he was also talking about how he, you know, was doing these, these, uh, music festivals and, uh, So like I was saying, this guy I'd worked with for a little while, he was doing, um, he was he was kind of a music promoter to a degree. He was working with different bands. I had some experience working with him in a couple bands. Um, I was in, used to be in a band called the 220s, and he started to work with that band for a while. And over time, he kind of started this record label to a degree, and like this promotional kind of agency thing. Um, and, uh, you know, probably had a pretty good relationship, and he was always a pretty cool guy. And then that band ended, and then a few years went by, and like I was saying, I you know, was it was one winter or springtime a couple of years back. I was trying to, you know, I was starting to get back into the mode of, like, booking some quantum gigs. And during that time, he was doing, um, the same guy was doing these, uh, like festivals he started doing these festivals and then he started doing these like electronic music festivals and i was like cool like and, and i saw like one or two of the festivals that he had done the, or that he was doing was at this club that i used to play at that i always really loved it's unfortunately closed now it was called chummies in ellsworth but it's this really great bar it had a really nice stage it was a pretty big place and i used to play there a lot with the 220s back back in the day and uh but I noticed he was doing these electronic music festivals where he'd have a bunch of different people, like five or six different artists, and they would do these shows. Um, and he, start, he was starting to do them at Chummies, and then he was doing them also like in these like you know kind of wooded you know areas where you know they were like up in Starks and, ha and Harmony and blah blah blah. And I saw that he was doing these shows and there seemed to be a lot of buzz and that people were going out to these things and they were becoming pretty popular. And I remember, you know, it, you know, sparked my interest cause I was like, you know, quantum didn't really have all that much experience doing festivals. We still don't. That's, that's something I really want to try to do in the future, but definitely back then we've done a little bit of that, but not, not very much. Um, but then I had, at that time I had no experience doing, uh, you know, the festival thing. So I was like, oh, great. I'm going to, you know, I do have a connection with this guy. He does remember me. We kind of did work together for a little while. He was pretty cool. So, so I was like, hey, I, uh, you know, I have this new band, Quantum, blah, blah, blah. And we, you know, uh, we'd love to, uh, you know, uh, try to get involved with one of your shows. And I said, yeah, we do like, you know, we do a little bit of music that's kind of like house based music, house music based, some ambient stuff. And then, we have a rock influence, you know, we have tried to have different styles, you know, it has a, a film score kind of vibe and, and he's like, great. So I sent him, I think, uh, it was probably, probably when our second album had come out, uh, digital palace. And I sent him out a bunch of the links and examples of some of, of the album that we'd done. And, uh, he got back to me and he said, yeah, some of this stuff is really good. Like he had commented on the heavier dance stuff. Um, and he basically said the same thing that the two other guys had said, where he's like, you know, basically, uh, I want to do stuff that's all like kind of heavy for these festivals. I'm trying to just book like the, the heavy kind of, you know, uh, dubstep stuff. And he's like, I, I can hear elements of that stuff in your music, but it's it's not really what we're looking for. Which was fine. But then he also he went he went a little bit further and he said, well, I think what you guys could do. And he kind of gave me advice that I wasn't necessarily like asking for. And, it, you know, he meant well, but he said basically he did the same thing where you should just try to like focus on the, the dubstep or the, the heavier dance element of what you're doing and not really do this other stuff, you know, like. And, and I was like, well, OK, that's fine, but, you know, it's not really what we do. And he's like, well, you should basically, he basically said, I should start putting out music that sounds like Skrillex or Dead Mouse. Then I'll find an audience. Up and, and if I don't, I'm basically, you know, shit out of luck. And I was kind of like, well, you know, it was disappointing, but 
so and then I remember after that happened, I looked up the artist that he had worked with on a lot of these shows. And they were basically all DJs. None of them were really doing original music. Uh, there were a few guys that were, but it was all very much, every group sounded like Skrillex or, or Dead Mouse. There was nothing original about any of the music. And it was all like carbon copy, you know, heavy energy drink inspired dance music on ketamine. That's all it was. And like after that situation, I realized like at the end of the day, if I had to like cater my music in such extreme ways and try to think about pleasing this person or catering to this audience or catering to this demographic and have, having to curate it for like the people who only like ambient music or the people who only love stuff that sounds like Dead Mouse, I would not at all do this band. I would like break it up. I would not. Have, I would have no interest in doing Quantum. And I would be like, I'm done. I'm not going to do it. Because I feel like, you know, pe some people like it. Some people don't like it. Whatever. But I feel like, for me, it's it's from a real place. It's like, represents something real to me. And, you know, and it, I'm not trying to make it into something it's not. I'm not trying to, like, you know, find that audience that's wearing only a certain colored hat, you know. So anyway, that all changed. And so that whole thing shifted. And since then, I don't really ever think about those kinds of things. And I know they, they could probably, that, that kind of attitude can kind of blow up in my face. But, and I've kind of done that same thing with the YouTube channel and the YouTube discovering new ways of pursuing this whole thing with Film Fanatic. I kind of have that same reaction to, to it. I've watched a couple of videos recently about YouTube, uh, these with these YouTube guys, and I got that same impression from them about how to market stuff. As a, and it was to me, it was exactly, virtually exactly like, like what this woman was saying when I first started talking about this. So it's I have a complicated relationship with that. It's it's a weird thing, but anyway. So I'm going to talk about now the main reason why we're here. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite Lucio Fulci movies. The New York Ripper, one of the one of the uh, one of the greatest movies ever. One of the greatest films of Lucio Fulci's career. Uh, Lucio Fulci, I've talked about before. I've done a couple of his films before for the page. Lucio Fulci was, you know, one of the greatest horror film exploitation directors ever from from Italy. You know, and there's so many great directors that came out of Italy. Uh, Dario Gento, Bruno Mattai, um, Lucio Fulci. Uh, so many great directors. And I always kind of gravitated towards his work a little bit more. House, I mean, I love all of those directors, but there's something about his work that just has this extra level of grittiness to it. Um and my favorite of all of his films is probably House by the Cemetery. I just love that movie so much. But The New York Ripper is just amazing. It came out in 1982. And it's, it's also one of the, the most... Uh, one of the sl probably one of the sleaziest movies I've ever seen. It's, it's, and it's super gory. And it's about this serial killer, basically, who goes around New York. And... He quacks like a duck, like literally. And it's totally demented. It's super sleazy. I mean, but it, this movie is just so great. So damn great. Uh, you know, and Lucio Fulci, again, I have done shows about him and I've talked a lot of him about. You know, I just feel like this is one of his greatest movies ever. Uh, the Blu-ray transfer for this film is just amazing. Um, there's so many great special features on here about about this film. Uh, just just killer. Um can't say enough about this movie. Um, House by the Cemetery, like I said, is probably my favorite one. It's hard to say. There's so many great ones. The Gates of Hell is just amazing. Um, from Beyond. I mean, he's done so many great movies. Um, and, you know, he was a master. Master filmmaker. You know, when you think of when he made these f films in, like, the 70s, 60s, and 80s, you know, with vir virtually no money... And they're all in-camera effects. 
Um, and he was able to create this incredible vibe uh, on set and for all of these scenes that are, I think, are kind of like works of art. And these, these films, I feel like, will be around forever because of the amount of care and love that he put into crafting these these incredibly sleazy movies. <clears throat> but The New York Ripper, if you haven't seen it, uh, definitely get this. And this, this edition is amazing. Like I said, it's got a whole bunch of special features on here. It's on the Blue Underground label, which is an amazing company. Blue Underground is run by William Leswig or Bill Leswig, who in his own right is one of the greatest kind of horror exploitation directors ever. Uh, he, he was the director of Maniac, and also Maniac Cop, uh, Maniac Cop 2 and 3. An amazing, amazing director. One of my all-time favorites also. And Maniac, for instance, is probably my favorite slasher movie of all time. Uh, but he kind of stopped directing films quite a few years ago. But he started Blue Underground. If you can see it right there. And Blue Underground is... His company that he started to basically, you know, and I think to a degree pay it forward. And he started reissuing um, all of these great sleazy grindhouse exploitation movies from America and Europe and Italy, you know, just all around the world. He started reissuing through his company all of these great classics um, and restoring them and, and packing them with just an amount, an amazing amount of special features and just so much like insight to how a lot of these classics were made and these films were also like huge tremendous a huge tremendous you know played a big role in influencing him as a filmmaker so blue underground's a great they're one of my favorite labels uh they have tons of lucio fulci movies on there so um but yeah again this is jason dean the new york ripper rules you got to see this bad boy if you've never never have so thanks again and we will see you next time peace